Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, and I will be reading verses 1, 2, verse 6, and the last two verses as well. Hebrews chapter 11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. Verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Verse 39. And all these having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. This morning, I want to preach to you out of Hebrews chapter 11, and I am about to do what is unthinkable and near unforgivable as far as a preacher's conduct. I'm going to scoop up all of Hebrews chapter 11 and give it to you in a single sermon. Now my recourse is that we are pressing toward the conclusion of Hebrews and we want to do that. And I assure you the treasures, the Mount Everest that Hebrews chapter 11 is, we are going to return and spend a considerable amount of time just in this one chapter, so fear not. My other recourse is that just this week I set in motion the reprint of my father's book, which is specifically devoted to Hebrews chapter 11, 26 messages, and though those those uh, books have been desperately scarce. That is going to see new life very shortly. But we come and we consider that the message entitled, Thank God It Is By Faith. It was three years ago that the world noted the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther, October 31st, 1517, walking up to the church door in Wittenberg with a sheaf of papers in his hand and a nail and a hammer and nailing that sheaf of paper, 95 theses, to that church door. It was a customary way of engaging others in a discussion. And that is what Luther was endeavoring to do. He had deep concerns. And so, three years ago was the 500th anniversary of that most key single day in the Protestant Reformation. Some celebrated it, some cursed the day. But let me point out to you that this past week and the weeks that are immediately before us, 500 years ago, were very specific also in the unfolding of the Protestant Reformation. It was this past Tuesday, October the 6th, and 500 years ago that Martin Luther published his prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the church, a very shocking title, int intently made that, his famous writing which attacked the entire sacramental system of the Roman Catholic Church. And then we count Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yesterday, there was a knock 500 years ago on Luther's door, and it was the Pope's envoy with a message that Luther was to retract everything that he had come to so confidently believe. And so that led to the real stand which Luther took. And the famous words that he uttered, here I stand, 
I can do no other. Now, Luther is the one, of course, who wrote the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And we have it in our heads that Luther was this towering figure and that he was so absolutely strong in faith, but it was not always so. If we go back into the earlier part of Luther's life, he, as a priest himself, and one who was training for higher levels within the church body, he would spend literally hours in the confessional scouring and scraping his soul for any sin that he did or may have committed. And he would literally wear out the priests on the other side of the veil because he would be there laboring. And even after he left, he would think about maybe he had forgotten something and he would be tormented by the thought of having forgotten, having neglected, having overlooked something which he should have confessed to the priest. He was absolutely horrified at what awaited him with those unconfessed sins. That is the paranoid picture of Martin Luther as a young man, even as he served within the church. But then his great discovery of Romans chapter 1, the just shall live by faith, not by the works, not by the merit which they had accrued themselves, but the just shall simply live by trust in God and what he had provided for them. And so Luther, when he comes and when he stands, not before just one priest in the confessional, when he would later stand before a whole court of the church and he would declare, here I stand, I stand upon the grace of God and I stand upon faith in Christ alone, it was not that the Roman Catholic Church did not say that faith was not important. They, they readily admitted that that was a key part of it. But Luther, when he came and said, I trust in Christ and it is by faith alone that I enter into paradise. That is where every connection between the two was broken. Here I stand, I can do no other. Luther, he had gone down the one road of seeking to be righteous in his own works. And he had found that there was no joy, there was no hope, there was only the constant burden of sin that was weighing him down. There was the torment of purgatory and hell that awaited before him. But then he read the just shall live by faith. And he entered in, and it puts a solid foundation under him, and that was his standing. So I say to you, thank God it is by faith. Last week, as we concluded Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, we had a teaser for what would lead us into the hall of faith, the Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. It was verse 38 where we, were, where we were quoted, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And those two little words are what characterize Hebrews chapter 11 as we are reminded by faith, by faith, by faith. But I would also want to highlight to you what I call the bookends of Hebrews chapter 11. It's found in the second verse and the second last verse of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 2 says, By it, that is by faith, the men of old gained approval. Then verse 38 says, All these having gained approval through their faith, 
did not receive what was promised. Faith is held out as integral and as vital, and faith is what, both in the one side and at the other, is what gains the approval of God. Luther, he had sought, he had agonized, he had so wanted that approval of God, God's smile upon him to know that his sins were gone and that they would no longer be counted against him. But there was no approval, there was no confidence. But here we read that by faith and through faith, that approval, the blessing, the smile of God is ours. It is ours for sure. By faith. Now faith, we read, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This past week I have traveled many miles by road and I have enjoyed many hours to be by myself with my thoughts. I have considered how that the world balks at faith. What is faith? as though it's some horrible mystery, some great conundrum, and it needs an explanation as long and as wide as Canada. Faith is very easy. Faith is taking $100 and depositing that in the bank, and at the end of several months' time of seeing that you now have, with interest, $100 and one cent, and that you will be able at your leisure to go to the bank and withdraw that $100, that it will be there. It is faith which tells you that. Now people say, no, 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 that's, that's not faith. There's a system that is set up, and there are rules, there are laws that govern all of this, and, and you, you put the money in the bank and you get it back. That isn't faith. Well, I think that it is very telling, very, very telling, that someone would say, no, that's not faith, because actually their faith in that is rock solid. You also go to a business and you buy a, a fridge and you arrange with them, you put your plastic on the counter and you arrange with them that they will deliver that fridge on an appointed time. And you mark it on your calendar to be home in order to receive that delivery. And you say, well, faith has helped you to understand that you pay for it and you make your arrangements and Oh, no, 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 that, that's not faith. There's the Better Business Bureau and there's all kinds of systems in place so that that will happen. Well, once again, it's very telling that you have such confidence that that is indeed going to happen. Those who have lived in other countries or at other times, they understand that there are bank failures, there are business failures, and that those who thought they had money in the bank and they had all the assurances of the world, that they were for naught. Or businesses that failed and all of a sudden the delivery that you paid for, it's all gone. Or even complete currency failures and that what you had in your hand and you thought it was a considerable amount to see you along for a great while. It's nothing but fuel for the fire. So this world, it has faith very strongly on the horizontal level. And they think that there are organizations and government and that all is secure, but their faith is directed at these things. When we talk about faith, we are saying we direct faith to God. Now, here it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When I put my money, that hundred dollars, into the bank, I don't see it. I, I don't actually see it coming back to me until that day when I go in there and I hope for it. It's a conviction of something that I see by faith, me receiving back what I had entrusted to them, or that delivery that I had arranged for. I 
imagine that, that fridge coming through the door. And, but I, I see it only by faith. I don't see it until it actually happens. But I, I trust that it's going to happen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things which have not yet happened, but I am confident, I have every confidence that they will happen. Now, if I have confidence in the banking system of this world, which has repeatedly failed over the centuries, and if I have confidence in businesses which have failed thousands and tens of thousands of time over the centuries, how is it that I do not have trust and confidence in the God who created this world. And we read here, verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word, the Word of God. God was working with nothing. Someone who builds a table, they go to the lumber store and they take that and they say, I have created a table. You've created nothing at all. You've just refashioned and cut and you've, you've trimmed and you've worked with the supplies that you purchased in order to make something different. Well, okay, I grew the tree myself and I, I uh, cut the wood out of there. Where did the tree come from? It came from a seed. Where did the seed come from? Well, it came from another tree. Where did that tree come from? Well, it came from a seed. God, he didn't work with seeds that he got from some garden center and he didn't work with wood that he got at a lumber store. He, he was working with nothing. Just out of his power, these things came into being. And by faith, we understand that all that is around about us, what we see that is visible, it came from that which is not visible. By faith, Abel, offered to God a sacrifice. And though he is dead, he still speaks that sacrifice that was better than his brothers. By faith, Enoch, he was taken up so that he might not see death because he was pleasing to God. God just so delighted in the fellowship and the communion that they shared together that he was taken up by faith, Noah, he heard God talk about a flood, something that had never happened before. Rain? We read in the earliest chapters of Genesis that there was a mist that used to come up from the ground and water everything. They didn't have rain. And so Noah, he heard God speak, and by faith, he grabs a hold of that, and he says, even though I have never seen of such things, I believe this one who is speaking to me. And it says that he prepared an ark a hundred years in the building of it. A hundred years for the, prepare, for the preserving, for the salvation of his household. And he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We keep going. Abraham. When he was called, he obeyed God by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, but he didn't know where he was going. He left all of the things that were, he was so well acquainted with in Ur of the Chaldees, and he goes out not knowing where he would go. And the next verse says that he lived as an alien. When we were working our way through 1 Peter, we were talking about how that we are aliens in this world. Here, Abraham, he is an example to us in that he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Dwelling in tents with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. He was looking for something, it says. He was looking for the city 
which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He had left a great city, a city with, I'm sure, many comforts and associations, but he had left that hearing the voice of God calling to him, and he goes out to follow God's path. He goes along with his wife, Sarah, who received ability to conceive by faith, even beyond the proper time of life. She's 90 years old, and her husband is 100. And there is the promise, there is the fulfillment, because they walked by faith. Verse 13, all these, they died in faith, without receiving the promises. Were they fools? Were they misguided? Here the writer of Hebrews is speaking to people who are saying, you know, this isn't working the, out the way we want it to, this trusting in Christ. Here is a key word. All these died in faith. They were resolute to the very last breath. We are going to trust in God for His good promises. But they had seen them. They had seen the promises of God. Even though they were still just a little bit out of reach, they had seen them and they had welcomed them. And they had confessed that they were strangers and exiles. They were, in fact, aliens in this world and they were going home to that place which was far better. Those who say such things make it clear they are seeking a country of their own, and indeed, if they had been thinking of that country which they went, from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. Abraham, he could have said, you know, this isn't working out for me. I'm just not getting what I thought I would get here, and I'm going back. But Abraham, he was looking for that city. He was looking for what God had promised to him, and he kept looking forward and moving forward in God. As it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. And there is here said, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has, he has, it's not that he might, he has prepared a city for them talks about Abraham and how that he was tested and offered up Isaac. And there was a confidence in his heart that God was able to raise his son even from the dead. We read, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith Rahab the harlot. And verse 32, what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, some of the Old Testament characters, rather than naming them, how that they walked by faith and trusted God, it's given in short form. Quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And then... There is a shift, there is a, 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 it's more like a jerk rather than a shift. The chapter divisions and the verse divisions which we have in our Bibles, those were not there when Paul and Peter and John were writing the text. Those were added later. And I've sometimes wondered why this 
this jerk or this shift that takes place suddenly in the middle of verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection and we all want to shout hallelujah. But it goes on, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings, scourgings, chains, imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, tempted, put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, mountains, caves, holes in the ground. But they gained God's approval and whether it was all sunshine and all shouting the praises of God, or whether it was horrible times of persecution and affliction and the harshest treatment that this world could imagine, these people were looking for a city and they were looking for a country in which God had prepared for them. And the things of this world were of little consequence because they were walking not by the counsel of this world, they were walking by the counsel of God's word and they were looking not for the approval to gain the approval of this world, they were looking to gain the approval of God himself. And so whether it was good or whether it was all thunderstorms and clouds, their heart was set upon the Lord. Thank God it's by faith. Thank God it is not by the strength of our arm or by the power of our few puny brain cells or by anyone else that we know so often we say, you know, it's not, who you, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, you can know a lot of people in this world and it's not going to do you any good. But if you know Jesus Christ and if your confidence is in him and as Luther laid it out and many of the other reformers as well, if your confidence is in him alone, you're good to go. You're good to go. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your mercy. And on this Thanksgiving Sunday, along with all of the other blessings that we have received and that we rejoice in, we most especially rejoice that your salvation is the free gift of God. And that we do not struggle to obtain it. We do not labor and languish we do not pay for it. We receive it as your gift. And we receive it into our hands and into our hearts by faith, by faith. Trusting that what you accomplished on Calvary was indeed fully and finally, absolutely, completely sufficient for our desperate need, our desperate need. Oh God, May there be men and women here today who perhaps for the first time hear and comprehend and by your Spirit's mighty working they lay hold that it is indeed by faith and let their hearts also cry out, thank God, thank God indeed it is by faith. And along with Mr. Luther, may they take their stand upon your word and say, here I stand. Here I stand upon the word of God and upon faith in God, gaining the approval of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. If I have any hope of eternal life, I go no other place but here alone. O oh God, so work in power, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.